Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. I'll put it on the screen today for the benefit of those who are in the house of the Lord. Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. The King James text today reads, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Amen. I'm asking the question today, why do you do it? Amen. Why do you do it? If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, there is no greater function in the church there is no greater responsibility for the man of God than to preach the word of the Lord for the benefit of God's people we don't preach at God's people we preach for God's people it's my desire and I know it's yours that the people of God would be nourished encouraged lifted up inspired and blessed by the word of the Lord. Lord, that their relationship with you would grow stronger, their bond would grow greater, their faith would grow even higher and deeper than it ever before has known in response to the message that I would preach today. But I understand and I know, God, that without the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I'm nothing but a barrel with wind passing through it. I can offer God's people nothing of benefit. I need the great Holy Ghost anointing. I need the touch of God so that every word I speak is inspired and directed of the Holy Ghost. The people of God need their ears, their hearts, their very spirit today to be touched by the Lord so that they might be receptive to that which I would deliver unto them through the Holy Ghost. Touch every ear, every heart. Help us, Lord, to leave this servant, this service different than we came, better, empowered, loving you more with greater faith than we've ever had before. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. If you've ever had any question as to whether or not the soul exists, I got news for you. This passage answers that question. Because this passage says abundantly clearly that the Word of God can separate the soul from the spirit. So obviously the soul is not the spirit. And the spirit is not the soul. They are two separate manifestations. I've explained to people many times, being a one God, Jesus name, apostolic church, I like people to understand sound doctrine. Our faith believes that God is not three persons, namely Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that these are not three people, that's insane. To even use the word people or person to describe God is asinine. But the reality is God is one. God created man in his own image. 
The word of God says God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became a living soul. That tells you something about God. God is a living soul. Read the Bible. See if God does not at times himself say, my soul is, or my soul was. He does. The truth of the matter is, the soul is the spiritual blueprint. It is the spiritual bones, as it were, that makes up your person. The spirit occupies the soul. When the spirit occupies the soul, the soul lives. When the soul occupied by the spirit enters the body, then the body lives. If the soul leaves the body, life leaves the body. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Because life is directly associated with the soul, that living soul within you. God did not create you. He did not create me. He did not create the human race in the physical manifestation that we enjoy today. That is the byproduct of our disobedience in the Garden of Eden. We started out as living souls. We were supposed to, according to the book of uh, Genesis, we were supposed to be able to live forever. You could not live forever in a human body. Adam and Eve could not have been created originally in a flesh and blood form because a flesh and blood form could not live forever. It is impossible on planet earth for anything that is flesh and blood to survive forever. It is impossible. Our bodies are subject to gravity. That's why we wrinkle as we get older. That's why our form changes as we get older. Our bones weaken. Things begin to fail and they don't work like they, they should. People love to add to Scripture. They love to read into the Bible. And, you know what it means? I grew up in a, in a mainstream Pentecostal church, and I'm telling you, uh, they always had reasons to explain everything. But the funny part of it is none of their reasons meshed with the Word of God. None of their reasons originated in the Word of God. Well, I'm foolish enough to believe today Something that I've taught our people over the decades that I've been in ministry, and I've been pastoring since I was 19, and I'm 56, almost 57 now, so that's a long time. And I've told people over and over and over, probably said it at least a thousand times in my lifetime, Scripture answers Scripture. You do not answer uh, 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 something you don't understand by just throwing out some foolish conjecture. That is not how this works. If you have a question about something, then you ought to be able to find the answer elsewhere in the Word of God. The Bible says God created Adam in his image. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. We know God is not a physical flesh and blood being. Therefore, he did not create Adam as a physical flesh and blood being because God is not a physical flesh and blood being. He made Adam originally in his image a living soul. He had a spiritual body occupied by his spirit. When he disobeyed God, when he broke the rules that the Lord had set, which were so few and so simple, he was demoted in nature. He was forced then to wear, the Bible uses the terms that God made coverings for them of animal skin. If you go into the Hebrew, if you study the word and the etymology of the term, it literally can mean flesh. That's why humanity falls under the scientific category as what? Animal. We're in the same category as a lion or a giraffe or an elephant or a dog. Animal. When man disobeyed God, the Lord said, fine, 
you can't remain in my image. You cannot continue to walk as the spiritual being because I said in the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. Now listen, the mistake people make. Well, God said they die that day. No, we didn't. God said that as of that day, death would be certain for them. Well, how would death become certain for them? It's easy. They were demoted in nature. No longer living souls. Now, they were animals. They were like the animals. That's why God said to Adam, now you're going to have to till the field. Now you're going to have to uh, wrestle with thorns and deal with stones. Now you're going to have the sweat of your brow and you're going to bleed when you're pregnant. He said to Eve, now you're going to have pain in childbirth. Why did, were all these things punishments on me? No. If they'd been created flesh and blood to begin with, then they would have known all these things to begin with. But in the garden, A, it was not necessary they procreate because they were going to live forever. Procreation is a species struggling to continue to survive. There, there was no need for Adam and Eve in the garden. Is there any record in the Garden of Eden that they had a single baby? No, there isn't. They did not have any children until after the fall. Got news for you folks. The book of Genesis is not written in perfect chronological order. There are things said in one place that later you look and say, well now wait a minute, if God said this here, then why did they not do anything until then? If God told Adam and Eve initially to be fruitful and multiply, why didn't they? They didn't until after the fall. Then they began to be fruitful and multiply. Well, of course, because it was only after the fall that it became necessary for them to multiply and be fruitful in order that the race, the species, would live on and continue. So anyway, the soul and the spirit are married, they're joined to one another, they're dependent upon one another for life. And yet the Word of God says that the Word of God is so sharp and so powerful that it is able to divide even the soul from the spirit. Wow! That's a function that no knife nor any spear or sword in this world can possibly perform. It says also that it's, a, it's able to divide the joints from the marrow. In other words, it's able to cut through bones so that the marrow can be exposed. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Many people do many things for many different reasons. It would be nice to think that every marriage was created because of love. That every person who gets married does so because they love the other person. It'd be nice to think that was the case. But we know some high profile couples in our world today and it's not real hard to figure that she hooked on to him because of his money. Because God knows his personality stinks. God knows he's not much to look at if I tell the truth. How many couples do you know? And the woman almost practically announces it every time she walks in the room. I married him for his money. I married him. You follow what I'm telling you? How many fellas marry a woman because they want the status of having a beauty at their side? Do they love her? Are they crazy about her? No. Uh-uh. No, she is a prop for them. She helps to booster their image. 
Uh huh. Be nice to think every marriage was the byproduct of love. It would also be nice to think that every police officer pursues that occupation out of a deep desire to serve their community, to protect the weak and the vulnerable. But truth be told, many marriages are little more than a business transaction and many law enforcement personnel become police officers because they enjoy the power and authority a gun and a badge affords them. In the end, no one can truly know what motivates another to do anything. The same can be said of Christianity and Christian service. Why do we believe? Why do we strive to live for the Lord? Why do we go to church? Why do we call ourselves a believer, a child of God, a Christian? While it might be nice to think that all professed Christians do so out of sincere love for God, the truth is there are any number of reasons many of which are less honorable and less noble, but there are any number of reasons that people profess to be Christian. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. But the Word of God tells us that the one with whom we have to do possesses within himself something so powerful that it is able to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Got news for you, my friend. If you think you're fooling God with your own religious spirit that runs around professing you're a Christian and all the while you're hateful and homophobic and cruel and malicious and nasty, Got news for you, sweetie. You hadn't fooled him not the least bit. You hadn't fooled most of the human race either. But you certainly have not fooled God. And when you stand before the Lord in judgment, the Lord is going to look at you and He's going to know the only reason you even bothered to call yourself a Christian, the only reason you even bothered to identify as a child of God is because you could use my word. You could twist it and pervert it in order to be hateful and malicious to others. And I tell the truth. There are some people that use Scripture, that use the Bible to be abusive and nasty to others. And I tell the truth. And honey, that's why they go to church. Chances are the church they go to has got a preacher and full of people in the pews who have the same motivation mm -hmm. because birds of a feather flock together. I'm going to tell you, I've walked into churches that were so legalistic, especially in the apostolic faith. I've walked into churches so legalistic, my God, you could cut the legalism with a knife. It was so heavy and so muddy and mucky. You literally could feel that demonic religious spirit in the atmosphere. It was that bad. I remember a church in Fort Worth years ago when I was still in the Trinitarian Pentecostal church. This church should have been able to have been a light to me and a beacon to me to help me see the apostolic way. But it was years later that I finally saw it. Because this church was so legalistic. The pastor had more rules and more regulations that he preached for his people than you could ever know. My God, it was hideous. When they came to church, the men only wore black pants and white shirts. Couldn't wear ties. Couldn't wear a shirt of any color. Had to be white. Pants had to be black. I mean, this is stupid. Why in the world should a church... 
be telling people how to dress right down to the color of their garments. The ladies wore the longest dresses and the longest sleeves. What always made me laugh is they also wore the most outlandish and crazy hairstyles you ever saw in your life. They didn't cut their hair as many apostolics don't. And so therefore they took their long hair and boy they would just create. I mean you knew women from that church literally by their hairstyle. Because even other holiness churches, even other Pentecostal churches or apostolic churches, the ladies would wear much simpler, you know, hairstyles. But oh, if they went to Brother So-and-so, I'm not going to say his name because I just don't want to bother. But if you went to his church, man, they had the most crazy hairstyles. Oh my goodness. My good curls and pipe curls and all the it, it looked like you know somebody turned their head into a work of art because he taught them all oh, women are to glory in their hair. Their, the Bible said that the hair is their glory. They can glory in it. So they wear all this. One day I was kind of down and I decided I would visit this church for a service. I've never been there. They were having a revival and I said, I'm going to go visit this church. And I went in and I sat there and the people there, let me tell you, they don't talk to you if you're not part of their crowd, if you're not part of their number, they don't want to be bothered with you one bit. Oh, but if you visit their church, now they're going to be friendly. But in the world, nah, they won't talk to you. I worked as a checker at Safeway, and there are people from that church that come through, and they literally would not even talk to you while you're checking their groceries. They look somewhere else. To be, they're too holy for you. Went into that church. They had a visiting preacher preaching. And let me tell you something. He began, He was preaching a message on baptism in Jesus' name. And I was very interested and I was very moved and very inspired by his message. Everything he said was on the money. Everything he said was right. I couldn't argue with nothing he was preaching. And you could hear crickets in the congregation. The people sat there like they were Roman Catholic. Now I'm a preacher myself. I know when a preacher changes gears. All of a sudden I saw this preacher change gears. And all of a sudden he began to preach holiness. Hallelujah. Women should and men shouldn't be doing that and godly men shouldn't wear this and godly women shouldn't be and let me tell you I kid you not those people were on their feet shouting and screaming and hollering and waving their arms because he was preaching the holiness crap he was preaching the crap that inspired them to even be in church to begin with because living this lifestyle of theirs made them feel better than everybody else. Why do you do it? Not everybody in the church is there because they love God. Not everybody is there. And they think, many people think they're going to wind up somehow being able to convince the Lord to allow them into glory in spite of the fact that their motivation was anything but what God wants your motivation to be if you would spend eternity with Him. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, we read a little story. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. 
And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, meaning he set them apart, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Listen, look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. See, a lot of people, Tommy, think they're going to stand before God in the judgment, and they're going to somehow make heaven because of the show they put on, because of the act they put on during the course of their life. Well, Lord, I ran around calling myself a Christian. I went to church. Why, you know, I believed this and I believed that. But did you love me? Don't you remember the conversation I had with Peter? Don't you remember that time that I looked at him three different times and I asked him a question and the question wasn't Peter do you believe on me? Peter do you believe on me? Peter do you? No, 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 that wasn't the question. What was the question? Peter do you love me? Oh my goodness. Peter said well, Lord you know I do. The Lord said feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I do. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Three times he asked this question. Obviously, this is something that's important to him, isn't it? That we not be serving him out of fear. That we not be serving him out of obligation. That we not be serving him out of some selfish or secret motivation. But that we be serving him out of love. God wants us to love Him. The great commandment that God gave to Israel in Deuteronomy 6 and 5 and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. God wants a people who love Him not people who are terrified of Him. Not people who have been beaten into submission. Not people who serve Him out of fear or terror. I have a family member of my own who one time we were talking and, uh, you know, I was talking to her about being part of the LGBT community, but my faith... That doesn't affect one iota my faith. My faith has been real since I was a kid. And when I came out in 1989, my faith didn't all of a sudden disappear. I didn't all of a sudden become an atheist or an agnostic. No, I still believed everything I'd ever believed about God. I still believed He loved me. I still believe the Lord Jesus went to the cross and died for me. I still believe He was buried in a borrowed tomb and rose on the third day. A Ascended later into heaven, sent the Holy Ghost to believers. I still believed all those things. Unfortunately, I also believed the garbage that was preached from many pulpits that God hated my guts because of certain things in my life. And those things were things that I felt 
I felt I had no control over. I, I didn't choose these things. It was something that was there that I simply could not change. And if I couldn't change them according to the preachers I'd heard, then that meant I was headed for hell in a handbasket. So I left the church for three years. And I left God for three years. And I tried to walk away from Him. But thank God He continually would speak to me and try to draw me back. Because God wants a people who love Him. I hadn't stopped loving Him at all. My love for Him had not changed. I was convinced by some foolish preachers that His love for me had changed. But that was a lie. In 1 Samuel 12, verse 24, the Word of God reads, Only fear the Lord. Now, fear does not mean to be in terror. That literally means to give Him a place in your thinking. When you fear your parents, for instance, you make choices and you make decisions based on a thought process that includes their input. You... Friends invite you to go off and do something that your parents had advised you not ever to do, drugs or drinking or whatever. And, and you sit there and you think about it for a moment. And part of your thought process involves how my parents have taught me, what my parents have taught me. That is fearing. And that is what God means when He says to fear Him. He said, I want to be part of your thought process. I want you to consider me in your decision making. I want you not simply to live your lives by the seat of your pants, but I want you to consider my instruction and my advice and my counsel. So He said, only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart for consider how great things he hath done for you again we're called to serve the Lord sincerely we're called to serve him in truth out of love why because he's beaten us into submission no because of all the things he's done for us we love him because He first loved us. Many will stand before the Lord in the judgment and find that they have not fooled Him at all. The entire time they lived their religious life, He was not deceived. He knew all along what was in their heart. God knows when one's faith is real. He knows when one's love for Him is real. He knows when one is serving Him from a place of love and when others serve Him from a place of fear. God has not called us to be scared into heaven, but rather to walk in relationship with Him so that we might know Him and love Him, not fear Him and be terrified of hell. I began to say a minute ago, and as happens with old preachers as we get older, we forget where we were going. I began to say a minute ago, I have a family member. I was talking to her about being LGBT and, you know, and how my faith was still very much the way it always had been. And this particular family member looked at me. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And she said, I'm afraid not to believe in God. And I looked at her. And I thought to myself, what a terrible place to be. Mm -hmm. In other words, when she contemplates faith in God and maybe choosing not to believe in God, the thought of not believing in God causes her fear and anxiety. Because she's been trained, obviously, that 
those who don't believe in God who see we're wrong, see wind up in the devil's hell and, you know, burn and blah, blah, blah. And so here she is basically confessing to me, well, you, you're talking about how when you came out and you were out of church that your love for God was the same. I did. I missed church. I missed the Lord. I missed the things that I experienced in my walk with God. I missed those things so bad. I, I, didn't, I didn't miss a particular congregation or a particular church. Or, but no, I just missed all the things that come with walking with the Lord. You know what I'm talking about. I miss the communion of the Holy Ghost. I miss going to church and getting a good shout on. I miss feeling the touch of God and the power of God. I miss, I knew what it was to be healed by the power of God. I knew what it was to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I knew what it was to be in a service where God would make himself so real and so wonderful. And I miss those things because I love the Lord. And my love hadn't changed a lick. And here I am talking to her about the time I spent out of church and how my love for the Lord never changed. And then she turns around and tells me that her primary motivation for serving God is fear. I'll never forget the pity that I felt for her. I thought, my God, isn't that sad? I serve him because I love him. She serves him because she's terrified if she don't, what's going to happen? God has not called us to be terrified and afraid so that we might make heaven. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 61, the word of the Lord reads, Let your heart therefore be perfect, meaning mature or complete, with the Lord our God, to walk in His statutes, and to keep His commandments as at this day. Let your heart therefore be perfect. Not your actions, not your conduct, that's not what he said. He said, let your heart be perfect. Isn't it funny that David, the word of God says, uh, the Lord spoke of David as being a man after mine own heart. That's how God described David. A man after mine own heart. His heart was perfect according to the Lord. David's heart was perfect. Were his actions perfect? No. Was he sinless? No. Did he do everything right? No. Did he make all the right decisions? No. Did he live a sinless life? No. But his heart was perfect. He was just the kind of lover. He was just the kind of relationship that God wanted to have with you and I today. He loved the Lord. He was still human. He still had faults. He still sinned. He still made bad choices. He still did stupid things. But his heart was perfect. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's what God is looking for today. People whose heart is perfect. In Matthew 5 and 8, the Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, He said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In Matthew 12, 34 through 37, the Lord was rebuking some of the scribes and Pharisees, and He said, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasures of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, 
They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Why will our words play such a central role in the judgment? It's easy, because our words are what reveal our heart. You want to know what's really going on inside? That's why I can't understand for the life of me how any idiot on this planet could ever look at Satan's right-hand man, Donald Trump, and think that he is a Christian or a decent and good man at any conceivable level. That man has nothing but bile and nastiness and cursing and vulgarity and wickedness come out of his mouth 24 hours a day. How can you be so stupid as to discount what the Word of God says? And I say the Word of God. I don't mean the Bible. I mean Jesus. Jesus said out of the good treasure of a man's heart, good things come. And out of an evil treasure, evil things and wicked things. Man, that man reveals himself every day. Every day, in every conceivable way. He's a liar and a deceiver. And according to the Lord, he, he describes Satan that way. He said, you're a liar. You've been a liar since day one. Hello now. Oh, I want to tell you folks, I don't understand people who can not believe the Word of God. Jesus said, our words demonstrate and reveal what's going on in our heart. In Matthew 15, verses 17 through 20, the Lord said, Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draw? Or in other words, you dismiss it when you visit the men's room or the ladies room but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile the man for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and then he breaks down what evil thoughts are murders, adulteries fornications, thefts false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. But you see, to eat with unwashed hands meant you weren't keeping the rules. You weren't following the rules. That's what the Lord, the Lord said, you know what, there are rules you can break. And you're not defiled in that you've broken that rule because the truth of the matter is it's not what you do on the outside so much as it is what comes out of you that defiles you. Why? Again, because it demonstrates your heart. It reveals your heart. It shows the world what is inside of you. In Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 10, the Apostle Paul writes, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Lord said, this gospel, you, you can't just, you can't just embrace it half-heartedly. You can't just embrace it intellectually. 
and say, okay, yeah, I believe Jesus rose from the dead because I've heard that all my life in Sunday school. So yeah, 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 I believe it. Okay, whoop de do. No, no, no. Because in the judgment, honey, it's not going to be about what you believed up here. It's going to be about what you believe down in here. Why do you do it? Why do you believe? Why do you go to church? Why do you claim to be a child of God? Why today do you call yourself a Christian? I've known people, you'll notice my illustration today. It's just a bunch of folks dressed. You can tell they're dressed from various professions and uh, various careers. And I'm asking the question, why do you do it? I've known people that had jobs and all they ever did the whole time they had that job is gripe and groan and complain about it. No, Booby, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about other people who just all they ever do is gripe and groan and complain about their job. They're miserable. They're unhappy. And sometimes their friends, including me, will look at them and say, well, why do you do it? If it's that miserable, if you're that unhappy, why do you do it? Why don't you take another job? Why don't you change careers? Well, I spent a bunch of money on an education so I could do this kind of work. I didn't know what the actual job would be like. I didn't know, you know, I'd have to deal with this, that, and the other. You know, people become lawyers, and all of a sudden they realize all the politics and law and all the foolishness that goes on in the legal profession. People become uh, uh, medical professionals, and all of a sudden they go, they, they realize the hours and, you know, the dedication it takes, and it takes them away from their family, and it takes them away from their home. People decide they want to cook for a living and they go to school to become a chef, but they don't realize in becoming a chef that they uh, that cooking becomes a chore for them. And all of a sudden, the love they used to have for cooking, they no longer have. I love to cook. I, I, ever since I was a kid, my mother will tell you, I've loved to cook ever since I was a kid. If I must say so myself, I'm pretty good at it, honey. My boobies back there, he knows I'm telling the truth. I'm pretty good at it. You can say amen real loud, you know, so everybody can hear. Amen. But I've worked as a cook. I'm going to tell you, if you ever want to lose your desire to do something, start doing it as a job. You can love something till the cows come home, and then all of a sudden when you have to do it for a job, for a career, all of a sudden it becomes work, you know, it becomes tedious and, and, and tiresome. And all of a sudden that very thing that just months ago you loved to do, now you can't stand doing it. Now, the only time you want to do it is when you're on the clock, so you're being paid. Do you follow what I'm saying? Why do you do it? Do you think there are not a lot of people in the church today who had no idea what Christianity was, who had no idea the commitment that it requires, they had no idea how much change in their life that was going to be necessary if they were going to genuinely walk a loving, grace-filled, merciful, kind compassionate, charitable Christian life. And all of a sudden they get in there, boy, and they go through the motions, but now they don't love it because now they're just doing it as a most. They go through the motions. You follow what I'm telling you now? Why do you do it? There are people watching me today online. I'm asking you, why do you do it? Why do you call yourself a Christian? If you can answer that question because I love the Lord. Because I believe with all my heart that God Himself God Himself came down in human form and manifested Himself 
went through the entire process of birth and, and growing and maturing. Why did he do that? Because he wants me to know that I have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of my infirmities. Why? Because he's been through the process. He knows exactly what it feels like to be me. Teenager, he knows what it feels like to be a teenager. He knows what it feels like to be at odds with his parents. He knows what it feels like to go through the acne stage. He knows what it feels like to have a crush on a little girl or a little boy. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He knows! He purposefully allowed himself to go from the cradle to the grave so that when we come to Him in prayer and we come to Him needing something, needing help, we can know that He knows and He understands. There's a reason Jesus did what he did. That wasn't all, you know, that would he didn't simply go to the manger for the purpose of the cross. No, the cross was his ultimate end, yes. But all the years in between served a purpose as well. So that the God of all creation could humble himself and become a servant. Who was he serving? Us. You and me, that's who He was serving. When He washed the disciples' feet, that was a demonstration of His serving us. That's why He said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. Isn't that what Jesus said? But boy, I'm going to tell you, all of a sudden people get in the church and they get in the faith and all of a sudden, the realities of living a Christian life. Sometimes the things that the Word of God teaches us and instructs us to do, uh, they're not easy to do. Sometimes the Word of God said we're to love our brothers and our sisters in the faith. And sometimes we've got a knucklehead in the church that we'd be just as happy to slap upside the head as to look at them. You know I'm telling the truth. Don't you sit there at your house and laugh and act like I'm not telling the truth. You know I'm telling the truth. We get mad with other people. There's so many Christians, so many people who quit going to church because I hate the hypocrites. I hate dealing with the hypocrites. Well, i got news for you, honey. That's part of the faith. That's part of the process. That's part of how God sharpens you and how God causes you to grow and mature in your walk with God. Dealing with the hypocrites. Dealing with the people who don't live this thing like they ought to deal with it. But they're in church beside you. That's all part of the process. The Word of God said, iron sharpens iron. And I tell the truth. What does that mean? That means the only thing going to make you sharper is hard stuff. Only thing that's going to make you quicker and sharper is things that rub you hard and rub you raw. Our church is an affirming and welcoming church. We accept all comers. I've had people in this church over in Dallas alone over the last 20 years who would try the patience of Job. I'm, I'm almost convinced some of them would make Jesus cuss. <laughs> oh, we've had some clowns. We've had some real characters. But I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm making fun, I'm teasing right now, but I loved those people. I loved them. We welcomed them here. I've had people leave this church over the last 20 years because of somebody else who came to church. They didn't like that person. They didn't like the way they acted. They didn't like the way they did. And I told that person, I said, let me tell you something. If you think, I know that person's hard to deal with. I know that person is tough to, to worship beside sometimes. 
But part of your walk with God is learning to overcome that. Learning to love that person in spite of themselves. If you can't do that, then honey, you're not really trying to be a child of God. You're trying to serve God on your terms, not on His. Oh, did He say that? Yes, I did. Why do you do it? Why are you in the church today? Why do you call yourself a child of God? Why do you call yourself a believer? Lastly today, 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 12, and I am closing. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, meaning what the Lord is capable of, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. The Apostle Paul said, if you do something, if you believe as a child of God that you're able to do something, or if you believe as a child of God that it's okay for instance, that you're LGBT or what have you. He said, as long as your own heart does not condemn you. He said, if, if you honestly believe that, you're all right. But if your own heart condemns you, now you have a problem. Because you're not being honest. You're claiming to believe something. You're claiming to understand something that you don't genuinely believe. Say, Pastor, you're scaring me to death today. This message is making me anxious. No, I'm not meaning to make you anxious. What I'm trying to help you do is you can't fix something unless you recognize it's broken. So we need to stop and we need to examine ourselves and we need to get before the Lord and say, Lord, why do I serve you? Do I serve you out of love or do I serve you out of fear? Have I been beaten into submission or am I responding to that which you've done for me? And if it's the wrong thing, if my heart is not where it ought to be, help me get it there. Hello now. Amen. I got news for you. The Lord's happy to do that for you. Amen. He's happy to help your heart to get right. He doesn't want you lost. He doesn't want you missing out on heaven. If you've believed on Him at any point in time in your life, then honey, God is working for you, not against you. Therefore, if you come to Him, you say, Lord, I need your help. I need to make sure that my heart is where it ought to be. I need to make sure, Lord, that my motivation is love for You and not terror, not fear, not anxiety. Lord, I'm not serving You so I can miss hell. I'm serving You so I can make heaven. Hallelujah. There's a difference. I tell people all the time, I don't have time to preach hellfire and brimstone. I don't have time for that foolishness. I'm too busy trying to preach people into heaven to be wasting my time trying to preach them out of hell. Hello now. If you're going to get into heaven, honey, it ain't going to be because you're afraid of hell. So my preaching that message is a waste of everybody's time to begin with. It doesn't help you to love the Lord. I've got to preach a message that helps you to understand the love that God has for you. The extent that God went for you so that you could be saved. And you could spend eternity in His presence. The job of the preacher is to help people see the love of God that's been manifested toward them 
so that they can love him back. Hallelujah. Because that is what God's looking for. So today I ask you the question, why do you do it? Hallelujah.